Alright, so remember what we did in the last video, last time, and that was to talk about complex conjugation. And we talked about this as an automorphism of C. Automorphism of C, the complex numbers. And as I threatened earlier, what we're going to start doing now is to talk about field automorphisms more generally. And remember, we care about these guys. We care about field automorphisms because they're going to help us. They're going to help us. Maybe I should just let that one go. They're going to help us understand polynomials. That's why we care about them. They're going to help us understand polynomials and their roots. So last time we talked about complex conjugation of the field automorphism. This time we're going to talk about field automorphisms more generally. We're doing this in the long run because field automorphisms will help us understand polynomials and their roots. And to get this benefit, this understanding, we're going to have to talk more generally than C. We're going to have to talk more generally than complex conjugation. So now's the time to kind of delve into this general stuff. And what we're going to do in this video is just give the definition. So this video, we're going to give the definition of field automorphisms in general. General automorphism. We're going to look at a really trivial example. Really trivial. You will be ashamed at how trivial this example is. All right. So let's look at the definition. Definition of a field automorphism. Well, if it's going to be a field automorphism, we better have a field. So let K be a field. A field automorphism automorphism of K is a function sigma, or we'll write it as sigma, satisfies the following. So it's going to be a special function, a special kind of function. And it satisfies the following four properties. First of all, we have that sigma of 1 is equal to 1. And remember, 1 here, 1 is the identity, the multiplicative identity. So remember some ring theory now. Multiplicative identity of k. Alright, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that sigma of alpha plus beta is equal to sigma of alpha plus sigma of beta, where all alpha and beta inside of k. As you said in the last video, the kind of snappy way that this is said often is that sigma commutes with addition. commutes with addition. It doesn't matter if you add first and then apply sigma, like you do over here, or if you apply sigma to each thing individually first and then add. You'll get the same answer. Alright, and this third thing is the analogous fact for multiplication. Sigma of alpha times beta is equal to sigma of alpha times sigma of beta. Of course, this is just saying that it commutes with multiplication. Finally, the fourth property is that sigma is a bijection. That is, it has a unique inverse function. So, it has unique inverse function. So, 
these are the four properties that characterize a field automorphism. You may have seen this definition before, but it's good to make sure that we're on the same page. So we'll go over it again. You might remember these properties are the are saying that it's a ring homomorphism. That's what these this bundle means. If you put these three things together, you're saying that sigma is a ring auto homomorphism. Homomorphism. And this last part is where we get, I guess, the uh, auto, the automorphism definition. It's just saying that it's invertible. So this is the definition, and you might remember that we already wrote this down when talking about this complex conjugation. So remember, remember, complex conjugation. satisfies these. Satisfies 1 through 4. We said that in the last video. So here's the definition of a field automorphism in general. What I want to do now is give a really trivial example and then make a remark about this definition. So let's do the example first. A totally trivial example. Totally trivial. Someone asks you for an example of a field automorphism, you could give this. So let K be any field. And we'll let old face one be the identity function. The identity function. So remember what that means is that 1 of alpha is equal to alpha for every element alpha inside of k. Well, then 1 is a field automorphism. field automorphism of k. So, yeah, I guess there really isn't much to check here, but maybe for just the exercise, well, what do we have to check? We have to check that when evaluated at 1, we get 1. Well, 1 of 1 is by definition equal to 1, so we're good there. Maybe I'll say this is the first thing. The second thing, remember, is that when we, or that the function commutes with addition, that was the second thing. So does it? Well, alpha plus beta is equal to alpha plus beta. So 1 alpha plus 1 beta. Because 1 of alpha plus beta, that's just alpha plus beta. And similarly on this side, 1 of alpha is equal to alpha, 1 of beta is equal to beta, and add them. So we got that too. We've got that too. And similarly, the third property follows. And the fourth one, well, of course it's invertible. Of course the identity function is invertible. It's its own inverse. We'll put an exclamation point there and a check mark there. So the identity function satisfies all of these properties kind of trivially. That's maybe the least interesting example of a field automorphism. But it's an important one nonetheless, and we'll see that in the very next video, where we're going to use the fact that the identity is a field automorphism. Alright, so that was a totally trivial example. And now what I want to do is make a remark about this definition, a consequence of it. So we have a claim. Claim. So, if we've got any field automorphism, is a field automorphism, and sigma inverse is its functional inverse, remember, what does this mean? Well, I guess this means two things. It's sigma of sigma inverse 
of alpha is equal to alpha, which is equal to sigma inverse sigma of alpha. For all alpha inside of k. Those are the equations defining functional inverse. There's a unique function, sigma inverse, satisfying this, so long as sigma is bijective. Remember, that's part of the definition. We know that sigma is bijective, so we know that it's got some functional inverse. And we're letting sigma inverse, as usual, denote that functional inverse. All right, so back to the claim. Sigma is a field automorphism, and sigma inverse is its functional inverse. Then sigma inverse is a field automorphism. Two. This is an important point, and maybe a little bit subtle. So we know that some function sigma inverse exists, right? We know that sigma is bijective, so we know that it's got some functional inverse. But maybe we could think initially that this functional inverse is just some crazy function. We don't know anything about it other than the fact that it satisfies these identities. And now what we're claiming is this isn't just some random function. This is actually a field automorphism. So sigma inverse is a field automorphism too. So just to spell that out, what are we saying? We're saying that sigma inverse of 1 has got to be equal to 1. And we're saying that sigma inverse of alpha plus beta is equal to sigma inverse of alpha plus sigma inverse of beta. We're saying that sigma inverse of alpha times beta is equal to sigma inverse of alpha times sigma inverse of beta. And we're saying that sigma inverse is a bijection. So, yeah, we started out with some function sigma satisfying these properties, and the claim is that these imply that its functional inverse will satisfy the same, or analogous properties. Sigma inverse will also be a field automorphism. So I'm going to leave this as an exercise. It's not difficult, but it's maybe kind of uh, good for your soul to do. So I'll leave this as an exercise for you to do. And yeah, this is an important point. We'll end up using this many times, so I encourage you to take a look at it.